humanity's first taste of alien blood splattered across the African sand as their hidden tank fired its opening shot straight through the skull of the Eliani ambassador. We couldn't comprehend it at the time. How could such a primitive race, whom we considered so weak and beneath us, dare to strike at an envoy that had arrived in peace? How did they even have access to such devastating weaponry? It was unthinkable. Our name is Raxor, and we are an Eliani historian tasked with documenting the first contact between our species and the humans of Earth. For centuries, we observed their planet from afar, watching as they slowly developed from simple primates into a civilization capable of harnessing electricity and splitting the atom. But even then, we never considered them a threat. They were too divided, too primitive, too absorbed in their own petty conflicts to ever pose a danger to the Eliani. When we finally decided to initiate contact, we did so with the utmost caution. A single unarmed scout ship was dispatched to their world, landing in the heart of one of their great desert regions. The continent was called Africa, and it was there that we would first learn the true nature of humanity. Our captain emerged from the ship with his hands raised, a gesture of peace recognized across the galaxy. The human male who had arrived in some strange ground vehicle matched his own palm against the captain's in a gesture we did not understand. And that's when it happened, a loud crack, a spurt of blue blood, and our captain fell dead. We retaliated swiftly, reducing the human and his machine to molten slag with our ship's plasma cannons. But it was already too late. The die had been cast, and humanity had drawn first blood. We couldn't let the human's aggression go unanswered. The death of our captain was a barbaric act, a clear sign that this species could not be reasoned with. They had to be brought to heel, subjugated before they could threaten the peace of the galaxy. Our high command ordered a full-scale invasion of Earth. We would land in the same desert region where our envoy had fallen, establish a secure beachhead, and then advance on the humans' population centers. Our scans of their technology showed they possessed only primitive chemical propellant weapons and vehicles. Against our plasma cannons and inertial dampeners, their resistance would be futile. We landed 10,000 soldiers, along with hundreds of plasma tanks and aircraft. The sand crunched beneath our boots as we disembarked, the sun glinting off our polished armor. We expected to sweep across this backward planet like a tidal wave, washing away the human filth. But we underestimated them. As soon as our troops set foot on the sand, we came under attack. Human tanks and aircraft appeared on the horizon, firing primitive but powerful solid-shell rounds at our positions. Their accuracy was uncanny, their range far greater than we anticipated. Our plasma cannons could melt their tanks to slag with a single shot, but the humans had spread out their forces, maximizing the area we had to defend. We found ourselves pinned down, unable to advance, as the human artillery pounded us relentlessly. I watched as a plasma tank beside me took a direct hit, its reactive armor instantly vaporizing the solid round. But the humans were relentless, and for every tank they lost, three more appeared to take its place. They could afford to trade vehicles while we could not. Eliani Combat Doctrine honed in wars against civilizations with comparable technology, favored tightly packed formations to maximize force concentration. But against the humans' primitive weapons, this clustering only led to disproportionate losses. As the day wore on and our numbers dwindled, I could see the confusion in our soldiers' eyes turn to dismay and then to despair. We had expected to be greeted as gods, to stride across the earth as conquerors, Instead, we spent the day huddled behind dunes and the wrecks of our own vehicles, desperately calling for reinforcements that never came. As the day turned against us, and our forces teetered on the brink of annihilation, our commander frantically requested reinforcements and orbital bombardment from the fleet above. But the response from our ships was one of desperation, not relief. Commander, the fleet is under attack! The voice from orbit crackled across the comlink. Swarms of small, uncrewed human spacecraft launched from hidden silos on the surface. They're too many to count, too small and quick to target. Our point defenses can't track them all. 
We're taking casualties. We can't support you. We have to pull back to higher orbit. Our commander slammed his fist on the hollow table in frustration. Without the fleet to provide fire support, we were well and truly on our own. We'd gravely underestimated the humans' cunning and resourcefulness. Even as we'd watched them for centuries, they'd apparently been watching us as well, devising weapons and tactics to exploit our weaknesses. In desperation, the commander ordered an all-out attack, seeking to overrun the human positions through sheer force of numbers. All units advance and engage the enemy at will, concentrate fire on their armor and break through their lines. I watched from my vantage point as our remaining tanks surged forward, plasma cannons blazing as they charged the human positions. The humans responded with a wall of steel and fire, their tank shells and missiles streaking across the desert plain to meet our advance. Amid the chaos, my eye was drawn to a one-on-one -on -one duel unfolding in a gap in the battle lines. One of our plasma tanks faced off against a single human tank across a long stretch of open sand. The human machine was a crude thing, all riveted steel plates and exposed treads, like something out of their ancient history. Its main gun was a huge, ungainly thing, a far cry from the elegance of our plasma cannon. I watched the Eliani tank commander's face on the viewscreen, saw him sneer in contempt at his seemingly outmatched opponent. He likely thought it would be an easy kill, a chance to even the score. But as our tank's plasma cannon started to glow and hum with building energy, the human tank did something unexpected. Its engines roared to life and it leaped forward, far faster than any tank I'd ever seen. It moved more like a wheeled racer than a tracked behemoth, kicking up twin rooster tails of sand as it hurtled towards our position. Realization and horror dawned on our tank commander's face at the same instant. This was no ordinary tank, but some kind of specialized vehicle built for speed and mounting a massive gun. He'd been suckered in by its crude appearance, and now it was too late. The human tank fired first, even as ours was still charging its shot. The shell smashed into our front armor, which held, but the sheer kinetic force rocked our tank back on its suspension, throwing off the plasma cannon's aim. Our shot went wide, splashing harmlessly into the sand. A heartbeat later, the human tank rammed us head-on, its reinforced prow puncturing our weakened frontal armor like a can opener. The collision sheared our turret clean off, sent it pinwheeling across the sand. I saw warning lights flashing, damage alerts screaming, and then a white flash as our ruptured power core lost containment. The human tank flew through the explosion, trailing smoke and flames but still intact, its momentum carrying it through to the other side. It skidded to a halt beyond the dissipating fireball, its armor blackened and dented, but its deadly gun already seeking a new target. It was a harsh lesson, and one that we would learn again and again in the days to come. Never assume you know all the tricks your enemy has hidden up their sleeves, and never, ever underestimate the humans. The tide of battle turned swiftly against us. Our all-out assault, our last desperate gambit, collapsed into a panicked rout as the human forces rallied and advanced. A wedge of their heavy tanks, behemoths of riveted steel and smoke-belching engines, spearheaded the counterattack, grinding forward inexorably over the corpse-strewn sand. Our battered forces fell back in disarray to our landing site, seeking the safety of our ships to evacuate this accursed world. But as we crested the final dunes, we beheld a sight that shattered our last hopes. The shattered, burning remains of our once-proud fleet rained down from the sky, streaking trails of fire across the blue expanse as they plummeted into the embrace of the planet's gravity well. The humans' orbital defenses, those swarms of vicious, uncrewed drones, had evidently proven too much for our warships. We stood there in numb, uncomprehending horror as the last fragments of our fleet vanished into the horizon, the rumble of their impact tremors reaching us long moments later. We were alone now, cut off and surrounded in the heart of enemy territory, our backs to our landing ships and the pitiless desert stretching out in all directions. The human forces formed up in a great ring around us, their tanks and artillery pointing inward like the spines of some monstrous mechanical hedgehog. I watched our commander raise his plasma rifle to his shoulder, saw others follow suit, 
and knew with cold certainty that we were about to make our final stand. We would fight to the last, take as many of the human dogs with us as we could. But before we could fire, a single human tank detached itself from the encircling formation and trundled forward. A scrap of white cloth fluttered from its stubby communications mast, a flag of truce. It rumbled to a halt a short distance from our lines, its engine growling like some immense predatory beast. With a clank and hiss of hydraulics, a hatch on the tank's turret swung open, and a human figure emerged. It was an older male, his skin weathered and his close-cropped hair steel-grey. He stood tall and straight in his drab green uniform, his eyes hidden behind dark glasses that glinted in the harsh sunlight. Our commander stepped forward warily to meet him, plasma rifle still half-raised. The human spoke, his voice a rough, gravelly rasp amplified by the tank's external speakers. He introduced himself as Colonel Patrick Bell and offered us a chance to surrender, to end this now with no further bloodshed. I saw our commander hesitate, saw the calculation and despair warring behind his eyes. We were beaten and we knew it. Even if we fought to the last, we'd gain nothing now but a few more worthless moments of existence. Slowly, reluctantly, he safed his weapon and bowed his head. The battle was over. The battle was. Colonel Bell laid out his terms. We would be allowed to live, to leave this world in peace, but we must abandon our weapons and equipment, leave it all behind on the sands of this bitter desert. A small price to pay for our lives, perhaps, but a humiliating blow to our pride as warriors. Our commander protested, tried to negotiate, but Bell silenced him with an upraised hand. He spoke calmly into some kind of communications device, and moments later, a new sound filled the air. A deep, powerful thrumming, growing rapidly louder. Shading my eyes, I looked up to see a fresh fleet of human warships descending through the clouds, a swarm of dark specks against the pale sky resolving into the stark grey shapes of battleships and carriers. They settled into a hovering formation above the battlefield, their shadows falling over us like a shroud. Bell watched our stunned expressions with a small grim smile. The ships that had destroyed our fleet, he explained, were merely Earth's planetary defence forces, their automated sentinel drones. These were Earth's true warships, their most powerful craft, crewed by their most elite warriors. They had been hidden in reserve, held back until now. The implications were clear. We were outnumbered and outgunned in every sense of the words. We had never stood a chance, not from the moment we set foot on this planet. These humans had played us like fools, let us exhaust ourselves against their defenses, all while holding back their true strength in reserve. Surrender was our only option. With a final curt nod, our commander accepted Bell's terms, and our forces began the humiliating process of disarming and preparing for departure. Our transport ships, never designed for combat, would be allowed to ferry us back into space, but under the watchful guns of the human fleet. There would be no further trickery, no desperate gambits. Our fight was well and truly over. As our soldiers filed into the transports, a line of dejected, beaten warriors... I saw Bell detach himself from the crowd of human commanders and approach our leader. They spoke briefly, the human's face unreadable, before Bell turned and strode back towards his own lines. Curiosity overcoming shame and exhaustion, I intercepted our commander, pressed him for details of this final exchange. The human colonel, as it turned out, was the very same soldier who had killed our captain at the disastrous first contact. But the captain's death, he claimed, was not the cold-blooded murder we had all assumed. The initial human gesture, the open-palmed salute, was apparently a sign of peace and greeting in their culture. Our captain's awkward attempt to mimic it had instead translated to some form of crude insult. The human, Bell, hadn't understood the gesture was a mistake. He had simply reacted with all the aggressive instinct of a startled predator. The war... The thousands of lives lost on both sides, all the destruction and pain in the end, Bell said, it all stemmed from that one tragic misunderstanding, a failure of communication and cultural sensitivity on both our parts. As we boarded our ships and left Earth behind, I mulled over his parting words, his suggestion that perhaps, 
If our species could learn from this bloody lesson, we might find a path to coexistence built on clearer understanding. It was a fragile hope, as tentative and delicate as the first new bloom after a raging fire, but it was a start. I watched as our commander stepped forward, his hand outstretched in the human gesture of peace. Despite all that had transpired, all the blood spilled on both sides, he seemed to have taken Colonel Bell's words to heart. Perhaps this could be a new beginning, a chance to forge understanding from the ashes of war. Bell hesitated for a moment, his eyes unreadable behind those dark glasses. Then slowly he reached out to clasp our commander's hand. A murmur of relief rippled through our ranks, a fragile hope that this nightmare might finally be over. But that hope died a brutal death in the next instant. With a sudden vicious twist, Bell wrenched our commander's arm behind his back. There was a sickening crack, and our leader crumpled to the ground, his neck bent at an unnatural angle. We stared in shock, unable to process what we had just witnessed. Bell stood over the body, his face a cold mask. Let this be a lesson, he said, his voice hard as granite. Humanity will not be caught off guard again. We offer peace, but we do not trust. Cross us at your peril. With that, he turned on his heel and strode away, leaving us to gather up the broken body of our commander. We carried him onto the transport ships in silence, a somber procession of defeat and loss. The journey home was a blur of grief and recrimination. We had gone to earth with such confidence, such certainty of our superiority. We returned broken and humbled, forever changed by our encounter with humanity. In the years that followed, the Eliani gave human space a wide berth. The price of misunderstanding, we had learned, was far too high. Even among the galaxy's other races, Earth gained a dark reputation. The short but brutal war had left an indelible mark, a grim reminder of the consequences of underestimating a potential foe. For the Eliani it was a particularly bitter pill to swallow. In our arrogance, we had looked down on humanity as primitive, just as we ourselves had once been underestimated by older, more advanced races. We had become the very thing we despised and paid a terrible price for our hubris. The scars of the war ran deep, and though an uneasy peace now reigned, the trust that could have averted the conflict was lost, perhaps forever. In the end, the Eleani human war stood as a dark monument to the perils of prejudice, a lesson written in blood and bone across the stars. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.